Hey everybody, welcome um, to this video and, and to this module, uh, this module that's all about psychological addictions. And of course, in this case, video game addiction is the is the sort of centerpiece we're going to talk about today. You've all been through that W5 episode, and, and I'm really happy to introduce you to two star friends of mine now, <laughs> Elaine and Jake, uh, both of whom you saw in that video. And yeah, thank you, Jake. And they're here just to kind of take it a next step. And, and we want to kind of ultimately get to the question of, was there anything else that could have been done? Is, is there there's some role that somebody could have played? And specifically, is there some role that people like you could have played, the fellow students in Jake's life? Um, so we're going to talk that through a little bit, but let's, let's kind of start. Uh, let's start with a simple question. Did, do you consider, do you consider yourself uh, addicted to video games or did you at that time do you now? Where are you in, in, in that sort of mind space of, of uh, psychological addiction in video games right now, Jake? Today, I accept that I have an addiction. I cannot say I am past that addiction. I don't think it's safe to ever say I am a recovered addict. I still always refer to myself as a recovering addict. But when I was in the thick of the addiction, the worst of it, Absolutely not. I would not admit, I would not even think or believe that I had an addiction. If you told me, Jake, I think you're playing too many games. I think you're addicted to video games. I would have laughed in your face or outright denied it and gotten very defensive. Even when I was in the earlier days of addiction counseling, of relapses, of going through work to improve this problem that I had, I was still in denial that I had a video game addiction. Rather, I saw it as time management issues. I saw it as willpower problems. And I did everything I could to not let video games be the problem in my head. Interesting. Yeah. And what if somebody had said to you something like, how about you just go two days without playing? Um, to, to... <laughs> What would have been your feeling? And by the way, I tell my students sometimes, can you just put your cell phone away for two days? Can you turn it off and put it in the in the drawer and just do that for two days? And I challenge students, very few of them are able to meet that challenge. So, so there's no judgmentalism here. You know, we are all addicted to various things. We are all addicted to our smartphones for sure. Um, and, but you know, what, how, what would have been your thought if somebody said just two days, Jake, come on. That's still to me a challenge. That's saying to me, Hey, you have a problem with video games. Therefore, I'm going to try and prove that to you. I would have played no games for two days just to spite you and then gone right back to my bad habits. That's not always as revealing as we hope it is. And I did, in fact, do that. I went cold turkey for several months because I thought, okay, games aren't the problem, but I need to put time toward other things. So I'm not going to play games for the next X months, let's say four months or so. That didn't solve the problem, nor did it uh, show me that I had an addiction. What instead happened was I just went into a sort of survival mode where I had to get to the point of playing games. I just had to make it to that day where I could start playing games again. And until then, I would not progress. I would not grow. I would not heal so long as I could get to that day. It wasn't until much later on in my recovery where I admitted to myself, I have a problem with video games and I may never reach a point where I can play them again. I have to accept that there is no day. As soon as I did that, I could start healing and I could start really making progress. That was the, the critical point for me. Interesting. Did, did it feel to you like the other players you were playing, if you had to do a rough estimate, of the other players that you were interacting with in this game, what percent of them like were online all the time? And you know, what, what, is, is there a community of addicts, so to speak, <laughs> that are self-supporting each other? You end up just finding those kinds of people, not because anyone's malicious or anyone's trying to draw you in, but because if you're playing all the time, you're going to inevitably find people at odd hours. And then you're going to find those same people at other hours of the day that are normal, perhaps. I was up all night gaming in my first year of university and sleeping throughout all the days, which meant that the only people I could come across were others like me. But I was playing on a North American server. I didn't have a bunch of people on the other side of the world who would be in normal daylight hours playing with me. 
I only had other people who are for some reason up in the middle of the night playing games all night long. So of course the people that I'll come across are other people who are playing typically excessively, if not the odd night shift person where it just so happens that they're awake at that time. But then again, you continue finding these people and you build friendships with them. You build a sense of community. So over time, you start to see your friends, the hours that they're on. You find the people who are on more often than less, because if you're always playing and you're always looking for people to play with, you're going to find those people that are always around to play with. So, I mean, I think that's a huge part of this whole thing is the social, we are very social critters. critters and, and if we find these people we enjoy being around, then yeah, that's going to keep us there. And that's going to make us want to return to that community. That's very cool. Where are you at, Elaine, now? After, after all, I mean, this is quite a journey for you as well. Um, and now you see Jake looking healthy and, and robust and, and seeming to have stuff together pretty well. Where are you at with all this? Do you still worry about him? I, I know there's never a day where we can celebrate and say it's cured, it's done. Uh, once an addict, always an addict. Um, and of course, there's always the fear of relapse. And I did fear it uh, fiercely for the longest time. Uh, but when COVID hit and uh, Jake reached out after the first several weeks and said, I don't like being alone. This is uh, really tempting for me. I, I'm thinking about gaming. Can I come home? And so to me, that showed me that he will reach out before it's too late. Uh, where a lot of addicts will relapse and then reach out. Um, and so there was some comfort in that, that knowing he uh, is fully aware and has embraced uh, a good support system in his recovery plan. And yeah. so, yes, I can sleep at night now. <laughs> and I'm really proud of him. I mean, it's been yeah. four years of gaming sobriety and uh, he's done some great work with me and, and, and is really willing to inspire others with his journey. And uh, as he says, he has become a better version of who he is during recovery. And that's just been an amazing process to watch. Yeah. I've and seen I think a that's... huge potential, a huge uh, personal growth with Jake yeah. and, and that's wonderful. And, and I think that's, as, as we'll get into in this video about a role that you guys might play in helping others, I think that's a good image to have in mind that, you know, where they are now, imagine, you know, Jake where he was when we saw him in W5 and, and, and look at Jake now, you know, this is the potential impact that, that getting through this can have. And I'm sure there were some really tough days uh, in between. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in fact, you know, the, the thing for me, when I watch the W5, the, the thing that I'll say haunts me or, or continues in my mind is when you said, Jake, that you got to that point where there were three options that you saw, which was you know running away, reaching out as you did, or taking your own life. And, and we know that some people take that third option. Um, we, we've seen it in that episode itself. Um, I, I think that's like how, I, I think one of the things I'd like to get through to my students is that psychological addictions, although they're very different from biological addictions in some ways, they can take you to that to a very diff difficult, dangerous place. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit more about? I, I know it's probably that was probably the peak of the hardness um, for you, but a little sense of like how serious were you contemplating um, those three options, and and how hard was it for you to to do what you ultimately did? I share this whenever I talk at CAMH with youth groups. I share this whenever I'm interviewed or go into spaces. It doesn't get easier, but I'm definitely more than willing. When I was contemplating what to do, I had just been spending several weeks in my residence apartment room, which was a house shared with two other people. Yeah. In that room, I was not bathing. I was not brushing my teeth, not brushing my hair, not showering, nothing. I was barely eating. At most, I would go out at the let's say the very early hours of the day or the very late hours of the day, depending, because I was up all night to get to the grocery store and stock up on microwavable fast meals so that I could spend the most time gaming. And even in that space, I would be avoiding meals. I would not be eating as much. I dropped down to 127 pounds and I'm six foot two. So I was severely underweight. And then I got the knock on my door. I didn't answer it. It took several tries by the resident assistant or the DOM, whatever the university refers to them as, 
at yeah. Guelph, it was resident assistant, who came looking for me to let me know that I was no longer allowed to stay in residence. I had made a late tuition payment, which meant that I was deregistered from the university. I was too afraid to check my emails to make sure that I was making the payment on time. So I ended up paying it 10 days late beyond deadline, mm -hmm. thinking I had the right date. The residence assistant came to find me because the residence manager had to been told that they were going to change the locks on me. And instead he went, that's, that's a bit too far. This is a scared kid, most likely. He's terrified, doesn't know what to do. I don't think just changing the locks on so that he's stuck outside when he tries to go home is a good idea. Right. And I did this outreach attempt for probably two weeks before finally one day I opened the door and I was given the ultimatum that either he could call my family or I could go back and reach out to my family. But either way, I could no longer stay there. And when I went back, I just had to sit and think because I pride myself on being a very logical thinker, on being someone who's excellent at problem solving. So of course I let my brain do its thing and problem solve. Right. What it did was it went in that moment, it analyzed what are the kinds of things that people in my situation would do? And therefore what options can I take? Yep. It found those three options of either running away, which fall time, Halloween of winters of Canada, we're going into winter. I'm not going to survive that. I'm not going to do well. You're not going to have, I video could, games either if you do I'm that. not going to have video games. I have my phone, <laughs> but I'm not going to have video games. Yeah. You're doing I could tell my mom about everything that had happened. And I'll be honest, video games weren't on my mind when I was thinking about the situation. It was mostly just absolute fear of if I reach out to my mom, I have to admit years of failure of me not living up to the potential that I set for myself. It was the expectations that I would do well that I thought were on me. It was that I had been lying to my family, the people who trust me most about the situation I was in. And while my mom loves me unconditionally, one of the statements that I often heard from her was that she values integrity above all else. Honesty is the policy. And I had been breaking that trust since I was probably 13 when I got to 19. If I sent that letter, my entire world as I knew it would collapse. I would have to face everything. And that was so horrifyingly terrifying to me that when I got to the third option, suicide, that's when I realized that it didn't matter how much my world collapsed, I needed help. Right. I had a window in my room that I looked out of and I saw the fall colors. October is the month of my birthday. It's my favorite time of year. Halloween is my favorite holiday. And when I just saw the trees around my residence building outside, I told myself, I'm not ready to go yet. I'm not ready to leave. So I only really had one option and that was to reach out. Yeah. That was the headspace that I got into. The fact that my brain could even conceive of suicide as a thing I could do right now terrified me more than anything else. Right. And that was the push I needed to overcome my own fears of breaking my reality and reaching out to my mom. <clears throat> it's just... It's a crazy, crazy difficult spot to be in. I, I really, um, you know, obviously we're all glad that you made the decision you made and it clearly was the right decision. What, what you mentioned you had two roommates. Did they ever say or do anything or, or did any of your student fellow student body ever suggest or in any way have any impact on any of the situation? I didn't really see the two housemates that I had in my second year. They weren't roommates per se, because they had other rooms in the two-story townhouse that we were in. Right. I actually don't remember their faces. I don't remember their description. I don't remember their names. I couldn't tell you who they were because I never saw them. I was just a shut-in in my room the whole time. And 
Of course, I'm not going to see them at 4 a.m. when I'm making Hot Pockets. Yeah. That's just a ridiculous thing. In yeah. first year, however, I had three roommates, I believe. No, sorry, I had two roommates in a triple of a very small space. We, we could see each other at all times. There was no privacy. And I was sleeping through the day while staying up all night. And they would come in the morning and see me in the lounge because I wouldn't play in my room in our shared room that would wake up my the housemates or my roommates i didn't want to bother them so i took my gaming down with my laptop to the common lounge and would game there all night i would eat skittles from the vending machine to sustain myself until the cafeteria would open up at 8 a.m and i'd get a breakfast and that was my dinner (laughs) it was a weird life to live but no one ever said hey jake i'm worried about you you never seem to go to class. You never have any conversations with us anymore. I was very social for the first two months or so. I had made tons of connections on my floor. I was a known entity. And then everything started to slip around second semester. Hmm. And people didn't reach out to go, hey, how are you? There might have been the, hey, how's it going? But never a genuine connection of, I'm worried. Never a question of, are you actually okay? You're doing things that are not okay (laughs) you're doing things that are very abnormal and seem dangerous i'm worried i never got that from anyone yeah and and they should have seen some of that so so elaine the way this all kind of started for us and and for you and i especially is i I gave a little talk to a student group and you followed and told this story um and i was fascinated by the story and i asked you the question at the end is, is there anything that the professors in Jake's world might have done? Me being a professor, you know, is there, is there any role that I might play um, in terms of preventing somebody else from running into the same kind of situation? Because I'm sure, at, you know, at U of T and at universities all through Canada and North America, this is happening. You want to give a, give a sense of, of what your reply was to that question? I was, first of all, so relieved. I've been waiting for three years for someone to ask me that question. (laughs) Because, uh, you know, at the time this happened with Jake, his university, uh, their uh, mental health system was being questioned because there'd been a number of suicides that year. And um, I had, after his uh, second relapse, taken him to student services and asked for help and they their mental health services were fantastic they provided him lots of help and support uh and so to me that wasn't the problem the problem was how do we get him there how do we get students to recognize that they have a problem and i was just baffled that he could be in a house for two solid months with two other young men and neither one of them noticed that he well, there was a smell clearly from his room because he wasn't showering. I, I visited him once and the smell was horrific. Um, you know, he wasn't eating much, uh, wasn't clearly going to classes, probably wasn't using the shower. They had to have noticed and no one said anything to him. And so my thinking was that I think that students who are closest to each other uh, need to learn within the mental health system to help each other out and reach out. Uh, because parents want to leave their kids on their own to let them fly and prove that they can manage on their own. They're adults. And and these young adults that are leaving for university also want to prove to themselves and their parents that they can manage. So we don't want to be invasive with our kids and they don't want to reach out to us. And so the closest person to them is roommates and classmates. And And so so to me, that was the missing link. And so that that brings us that this is the second reason why we're here. <laughs> so we're here for a couple of reasons. You know, one is just to give you a really concrete understanding that psychological addictions, although they seem, you know, they can seem like, oh, that's that's not such a big deal. They can be a very big deal. They they can take lives, you know, be it a gambling addiction, be it a video game addiction. There are many sorts of psychological addictions that can be very serious. So I, I hope you see that now with, with Jake's story. But the other more critical piece is, is, you know, what are roles we can play? What are roles I can play? But what are roles all of you guys can play? And, and one of the things Elaine just highlighted there is, you know, every campus um, has some sort of health and wellness center with a whole lot of expertise and a whole lot of desire to help. And so they're over here. And then you have a person like Jake over here. Um, how do we how do we connect those two? 
um, and, and who's in the best position to do it. Uh, and so, you know, we've kind of been talking this through since that original dialogue we had with Elaine. And, and the idea we had, and I'm curious to see, think, hear what Jake thinks about this, but that there's at least two things we could talk about. One is you can connect with a health and wellness center. And if there's any fellow student that you're worried about for whatever reason, even if you think you might be being oversensitive, you can connect with them and ask them to do something called a check-in. And somebody who, and I think you could do this anonymously if you wanted to or not, but then somebody from health and wellness would go and knock on the door. Jake might answer, might not. I mean, <laughs> this would be part of the, the story, but they would go over and at least, first of all, he would then be on their radar, you know, and, and they would be thinking, okay, students are a little concerned. Let's try to check in on this guy and let's, and let's see if we can, you know, form that connection and help. But the other component that we've actually heard a couple of times here that's super, super powerful would be just somebody saying, hey, dude, I'm a little worried, man. You know, it's like, ah, oh, are you OK? Everything fine? Um, and, and even if the person says, yeah, yeah, everything's fine, you know, that fact that they're seeing people staring at them with that sense of worry and, and like, hmm may have some effect on them, may have them view themselves a, a little bit differently. And if we can get these two things going, you know, if you could get a check in going and let that person know you're worried, you know, maybe the combination of those things could have could save a life, quite honestly. Um, so so what do you what do you think, Jacob, of, of, of that? If, if that had happened in your situation, do you think it, it would have worked or? Hard to say. I shared, I shared recently at I believe there was a, a CAMH group with parents. I was asked a similar question. And the reality that I faced, which was very personal to my experience, as someone who lied excessively in order to protect his own addiction, yeah. is that for me, and I can't remember if I said this in the W5 interview, the addiction itself was like eating. If you were to tell me, hey, Jake, you can no longer eat. From mm -hmm. today forward, there is no more eating. You're going to sit there and you're going to starve until you die. That's a very terrifying thought. Obviously, you would never let this occur. You would do everything in your power to find a way to eat so that you can live. Because if you don't, you will starve and you will die. You know that. Your body knows that. But when you have an addiction that is your entire world, your addiction becomes eating. Video games for me were food. Of course, I will do everything in my power to try and make you believe that I don't have a problem, that I can eat, that I can play video games and not be a danger to myself, that I can protect this coping mechanism I've built for myself just to survive in the world. Because if I don't have that, I will crumble and I will fall apart and I'll die. When a person showed me concern, when my mom showed me concern, what that told me was, I need to be better at hiding this. <laughs> Even though my brain still wouldn't accept there's an addiction there, there's a component that is dangerous, maybe it should have gone alarm bells, why do you need to hide this? Why isn't this a problem? The ultimate goal was protect yourself. Because for me, the state that I was in was one built of anxiety and depression. It was self-loathing, it was all-encompassing, and everything around me felt like it was falling apart. So of course, I held on to the single bastion that I had, which was video games. For me, if you're going to reach out to a person, it's not enough to say, hey, are you okay? And then to call on services to get them. For me, what I needed most of all was reassurance that my world wasn't going to collapse. I need to be able to see that things weren't at the end for me. Right. That was what drove me deeper and deeper into my addiction was this fear of everything falling apart. I need to know that it wouldn't. So if you can offer to a person an olive branch that's more than just concern, but is a show that not only are they safe, perhaps even they're capable, that they can survive in the space without that addiction, without that crutch. That for me is the solution that I've tried to come up with over days, weeks, months, years of being asked the question of what could people have done to help you? Right. What helped me most was when 
I called, or sorry, when I sent the email to my mom and she yeah. called me, the first thing she asked was, what do you need? And my immediate response, the thing that really was the deepest thing I needed was for her to just tell me everything would be okay. Fascinating. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no. I mean, it's, it's, it's all very, very fascinating. And, and we don't want to imply by any means here that there's this easy solution and everything will be fine. This is a challenging, challenging situation. Um, but, but what we don't want to do as a community is just let one of our own, you know, be in that room um, somewhere. We, we have to try what we can try. But I think that's, you know, a, a good point too, Jake, is this, this idea of, yeah, f seeing something, seeing a light at the end. And if you're feeling like you're in a down, downward spiral, that can be a very difficult place to be. So I think, I guess the point for students to take to all this is, is you know, it's not up to you to necessarily cure that person. You, you have yeah. to understand that it is a very difficult position. You want to be sensitive. Um, I, I mean, I, I know you said the concern just makes you you want to hide it more. I get it, but I wonder if it did a little bit more too, in the sense of just saying, well, at least people care to some extent. Like it must, it must be worse to be feel like you're going down in a hole and nobody even cares. You know, every, absolutely where. Um, so. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. For me, again, it was my very personal experience yeah. as someone who so heavily used lying and hiding as yeah. a solution. My, my fight or flight is very much flight. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm terrified to have confrontation. I'm very easily overwhelmed. For me, that was my personal experience. And that's why I needed that reassurance. That's not a silver bullet. Everyone's going to be different. And to your point, for some people, yes, that will be an awakening that will be an alarm bell what helps i believe from my mom's book where she talks about stages of addiction is that pre-contemplative state where before you're even thinking that you have an addiction that's where most addicts sit and if you can just get them into questioning that space right that's the biggest step forward into moving into looking for help yeah. being Planting the open seed. to help yeah, planting we, the seed. If you can that, plant that seed, then yeah. great. We have that image from Alcoholics Anonymous or whatever, where the first step is saying, yeah, some things aren't quite right here. <laughs> there, there's an issue. Yeah. I think too, what my approach always was, uh, we tend to focus so much on the problem, which is the addiction, that we forget that there's a person behind the addiction. And so in my approach was always one of compassion because I knew that's not what he wanted. He wanted to make me proud like any other kid wants to make their family proud. And so I knew there had to be some underlying emotional issue that was driving this compulsion. Uh, and so, you know, I worked from that angle as opposed to, so, uh, you know, just like Jake says, he needed to be reassured. He needed to know that, you know, this was going to be okay. We'd make it okay somehow. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. That that humanistic sort of perspective of, you know, that's what we are first. We are all human beings struggling through life in various ways and 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 just touching that humanity and, and admitting that humanity every now and then can can be a powerful force. Is there anything, Elaine, that you would so so you have I don't know how many students you may end up talking to through this video now. Hopefully we can get this out <laughs> widely. Um, you, you've just been through so much. And I, and I do want to just add that, you know, um, Jake was embarrassed because he wants to make his mom proud. And it's kind of ironic that by by doing the thing that was probably the hardest thing to do in his life, he, he succeeded in making his mom the most proud. Um, so just kind of interesting that way. But anything else you would like to, to add, Elaine, to, to the fellow students who may know something, maybe right now, and, and I would encourage you students to kind of think right now, is there anybody that that you sort of thought, man, maybe there's something going on there, but then you just let it slip. Did, does somebody come to mind in this context? And, and again, we're not just talking video game addiction. We're talking, you know, really anybody who may be struggling in some way. Um, if you do have some something, somebody come to mind, I don't know. I'm putting you on the spot, Elaine, whether there's anything else you would like to, to tell these students and have them thinking about. What I, I would say not to be afraid to approach. Uh, you know, I, I once made the mistake of not doing that. Yeah. And then I lost a friend. Uh, he did commit suicide. Um, and I regretted that I didn't uh, do more. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, be brave. Um, yeah. Name it. Uh, the, there is an issue. Um, and go with your gut. Because, you know, 
every time I asked Jake questions about staying up late, uh, losing weight, uh, you know, not showering, he always had very justifiable answers. Well, school's hard. I'm up late doing assignments. I don't have time. Um, but my gut told me something wasn't right. And so follow that, that voice inside your head, that funny feeling you're getting, that instinct. Uh, if you think something's wrong, you know, trust it. Excellent. Excellent. So I, I think just final words, you know, when we come to a place like a university, it's community. We, we gain all these advantages of being part of the community, but there's also responsibilities. And, and the core responsibility is we are fellow human beings. We do need to look out for each other. And, and if there's opportunities to play a role, yeah, don't just walk away. Um, you know, find, find that role. It's not going to, you know, the worst the person might get angry with you or, or something like that that's okay. You know, <laughs> you, you can survive that. Um, and again, if by alerting people like health and wellness, they can sort of follow the ball a little bit more um, and, and hopefully be persistent enough. Like it's in Jake's case, it was, you know, someone trying to kick him out of residence, knocking at the door. I would rather it have been a health and wellness person, you know, maybe being a little persistent and, and they, they know pretty well how to handle some of these situations better than most of us do. So having somebody like a professional involved while also mm -hmm. being a friend, um, I think is, is a great combination. Guys, I wanna, Jake, I, I wanna thank you especially and, and Elaine, I mean, you, you guys are, I mean, just the fact that you've taken this very difficult time of your life and, and spun it into so much positivity and so much um, attempt to help others is fantastic. I hope this video and this assignment kind of does that for you guys as well. Um, I'm, I'm just very proud of both of you guys, how you've been through this. And, and I appreciate you spending time uh, with, with me and with the class. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you. My pleasure.